I can find the window. Got it. Hold on. All right. I'm recording. We're recording. It's recording. At recording. Everybody is recording. That is supposed to be recording. All right, folks. Welcome back to Progressive Rehab and Strength. It would be better if I said that better. <laughs> Don't you usually say the Progressive Rehab and Strength podcast? I do usually say that, yes. Mm. <laughs> All right, folks. Welcome back to the Progressive Rehab and Strength podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rory Alter, head clinical coach here at Progressive Rehab and Strength with my awesome co-hosts, Dr. Alyssa Haveson and Dr. Don Patrisso. Dr. Alyssa, we are not firing you from co-host, but John just <laughs> seems to be here very regularly now on the podcast. So um, it's just, it's fun to have my husband in the in the co-hosting seat with, with all of us. So um, in today's episode, we are going to be talking all about the hip in barbell training. So uh, all about the functional anatomy and biomechanics of how the hip functions and works, how the muscles, the bones... Um, somewhat of the neuro neurological system function um, in barbell training loaded um, and that we don't have to be so scared of it. And I think that this series on the functional anatomy stuff related to barbell training of each area of the body has been really helpful for a lot of people because the more you know about your body, the better you know how to utilize it and work with the body barbell system. So we have brought back John Pedrizzo, a professor at Adelphi University physical th in the exercise science department. He teaches um, kinesiology, biomechanics, intro to sports medicine. You teach a lot of other classes that I always forget. Um, allied health. Uh, what else do you teach? Well, not all of that is accurate, but we'll just oh. say okay <laughs> for, for now. <laughs> what do you teach? <laughs> I know you teach kinesiology and biomechanics. I do. And you intro to allied health professions, right? Uh, that is not a class, no. That is not a class? So then what's no. the class? What's your intro class? Introduction to exercise science. But isn't there an allied health, al allied health professions class that you teach? No. There was? Never mm. was? No? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. No. It's just like me not remembering what year you were born for the first 10 years of our relationship. I'll it was, probably it never... was longer than, longer it than was that. It was longer than that? Well, yes. I know what year it is, but I will not give what your age on the podcast. But um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so what do you teach? Uh, every semester I teach kinesiology and I teach a class called Medical Aspects of Sport, which is kind of like an introduction to orthopedics. And in the fall, I teach biomechanics and I do teach that introduction exercise science course. Um, and, uh, we also created the new clinical training course that I'm doing in the fall. And then, uh, in the spring, I teach a strength and conditioning methods course, uh, and theory of exercise prescription course as well. Oh, wow. No, yeah, I'm so you were a little off, Roy. I was a little <laughs> off. I knew it's it's hard to remember all these courses. Every semester is different. His schedule always changes. He's, you know, in advisement and working on this study and that study. And, like, I'm just like, okay, you're great. You're awesome. You're, like, a world-renowned professor. And I'm just this little. That is not true. It is so true. You are just no. totally awesome. Anyway, um, so, see, John is a professional in all of this stuff. And he teaches this stuff. And he's a tenured professor at Adelphi University. So he has been teaching kinesiology professionally um, and biomechanics professionally for 10 years. Um, he's been in the physical therapy profession for 12, almost 13 years. And right? No. No. 10. No. Almost 11. 11. Almost 11. 11. As long as I have. So I don't even know how long I've been in this profession. And um, you've been in the personal training and strength and conditioning realm for 15 years uh, 17 years 17 years um and you know you started weight training in high school so this is something you mm -hmm. know obviously like Alyssa and I are professionals at this but you teach 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 this so let's dive I, into the hip I, I, tr I try to um all right John so give us hip anatomy and, and function <laughs> functional anatomy 
Uh, okay, so if we are going to talk about the anatomy of the hip, uh, we should start by talking about the bony structure and the, the joint. Um, so the, the hip is a ball and socket joint. Um, it's a fairly uh, deep socket, uh, very robust joint. Obviously, uh, it's responsible for transmitting a significant amount of force between the upper extremity um, and the trunk and the lower extremities. Uh, but it's also a fairly mobile joint, uh, moves in all three planes of motion. Uh, so it can flex and extend, AB and AD duct, and internally and externally rotate. Uh, so it has three degrees of freedom. Um, so it really is a nice kind of balanced structure from that standpoint. Um, so the uh, the socket of the hip joint is what we refer to as the acetabulum, and that is comprised of all three pelvic bones. So the ilium, the ischium, and the pubic bones all contribute to the formation of the acetabulum. And for uh, the just my usual disclaimer at this point in the in the functional anatomy podcasts, if you're listening to this on our podcast platform and this stuff is totally confusing you and you cannot envision what he's talking about, if you head over to our YouTube channel, which we'll link in the show notes, you can um, watch the YouTube video of this podcast with um, the respective anatomy uh, images overlaid so that you have an understanding of what he's talking about. And uh, so the acetabulum articulates with the femoral head, right? The head of the femur. Now the femur uh, is the longest and strongest bone that we have in the body. Um, and what's kind of interesting about the interaction between the acetabulum and the femur is that the uh, femoral head doesn't sit all the way inside of the socket. So there's a little bit of space in between um, the head of the femur and the uh, essentially deepest part of the acetabulum. But that kind of works a little bit like a vacuum uh, and kind of aids in the suction between uh, between the two structures. So um, in addition, we have uh, the acetabular labrum right? And the labrum uh, is a ring of fibrocartilage around the acetabulum that attaches to the femur uh, that aids in stability of the joint, uh, decreases the amount of force that gets transmitted to the articular cartilage. So it's protective of the articular cartilage. Uh, so it's an important structure from that standpoint. Uh, we have a very uh, robust uh, joint capsule around the, uh, around the hip joint. Um, and the joint capsule has several capsular ligaments. So the uh, iliofemoral ligament, uh, the ischiofemoral ligament, and the pubofemoral ligament. Uh, so essentially one ligament that runs from each of the three uh, pelvic bones and attaches to the femur. Uh, and all of those ligaments limit extension of the hip. So they get tight, so, and the capsule in turn gets tight uh, as we move into uh, greater amounts of hip extension. And hip um, extension, just because I think that there could be some people who don't know what these positions are, or mm -hmm. people, like the femur is your thigh bone, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so if you're sure. Just listening. So um, extension of the hip is when your leg moves backwards, so to the backside of your body. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, you. um. So the pubofemoral ligament also limits um, uh, abduction uh, range of motion to, to a certain degree as well. Um, so those are kind of the uh, passive structures surrounding the joint. Um, something else that I think is worth talking about is that we have a few different angles that, that get created uh, between the femur uh, and the acetabulum. Um, so the first one is uh, the angle of inclination. So that's an angle that gets created between the head and neck of the femur, um, essentially, and the uh, shaft of the femur. Uh, and in adults, it's roughly about 125 degrees or so. Um, now, if you have a, uh, an increased angle of inclination, uh, we refer to that as being uh, coxa valga. And if you have a decreased angle of inclination, uh, we say that that's coxa vera. Now, the only reason I mention that is because those two things are associated with other, you know, uh, 
alignment issues, let's say, uh, at the knee. So if you have coxivalga, you are more likely to have genuvarus, which is what most people refer to as bow-leggedness, uh, you know, when they look at uh, the femur and the knee. Uh, and if you have coxa uh, vera, then you are more likely to have genu valgus, which is what a lot of people refer to as being knock need, right? So, so there's a relationship between the hip, uh, the knee, and the foot and ankle in terms of you know how someone presents from an alignment standpoint. Um, another angle that we see that's created at the hip uh, is referred to as the angle of torsion. And essentially, this would be an angle that you'd be able to observe if you were looking at your femur from the top down, which is kind of hard to picture, right? But torsion implies like twisting. So the femur itself, uh, I mentioned it's the longest and strongest bone of the body, but it is uh, it has a twist in it, essentially. So the femoral head and neck at the top are rotated anteriorly relative to the femoral condyles, which are the most distal part of the femur. That's, uh, that's what helps to form the uh, superior portion of the knee joint. Um, about 12 to 15 degrees, roughly. And, you know, again, we talked about this with the spine. Um, you'll see some different numbers in regards to like the normal ranges for this stuff. So, uh, but just assume that it's roughly around there. Uh, so essentially, the superior portion of the femur is rotated anteriorly or twisted a little bit anteriorly relative to uh, your knee. You know, you can think of it that way. Uh, now, if someone has an excessive uh, torsion angle, either forward or backwards, right, we refer to that as uh, being antiverted or retroverted. Um, so if someone is antiverted and they have more than a greater angle of torsion than we would expect to see, right, let's say they, they have their femoral head and neck is rotated 20 degrees anteriorly relative to uh, the femoral condyles, then essentially, the way you can think about that is their um, femoral head is kind of externally rotated in their acetabulum, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we typically see with that presentation is that that's a person that's going to have a lot more internal rotation range of motion, but not as much external. So they, they can't really turn their foot out as far as we would expect, but they can rotate their foot in a lot. Um, and then the opposite would be something that we refer to as retroversion, right? So if they have a lot less um, or a decreased angle of torsion, then um, it's the opposite scenario. So essentially, the femoral head is almost internally rotated inside the femur. So these are people that uh, inside the acetabulum. So these are people that do not have a lot of internal rotation range of motion, but they tend to have a lot of external rotation range of motion. And like um, me. <laughs> yeah, so you're so you are someone who's uh, who's retroverted, uh, which we found out when you went through your you know right. problems in regards to your hip so and that sort of thing. I have a question about um, you know retroversion and antiversion and kind of looking at coxa vera and valga and looking at the knees in relation to all of that and people's foot position. So, you know, one of the things out there is in the barbell training world, especially in the rehab world, is to do all these table assessments to figure out if a person has retroversion or antiversion or all these types of things. Do you feel that it's necessary to do a table assessment to assess someone's hip position, what their anatomy is, um, in order to identify what their ideal squat stance is? Uh, no, I think that that's something that you can really just figure out through seeing what's most comfortable for the, mm -hmm. for the person, um, and through a little bit of experimentation when you first start working with them, you know, if there's somebody that's coming into you maybe with a history of hip pathology, mm -hmm. it'd be something that you want to take a look at before mm -hmm. you get them under the bar and start lifting. But, you know, if it's just your average everyday, uh, person that's interested in learning about training, uh, I don't think that that's necessary, no. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, and I, I think that you can also figure these, I mean, it's not, one, it's not necessary to identify, just like you said, um, it's not necessary to identify this in someone who's asymptomatic. 
Um, but let's say you, you know, you are seeing that someone's struggling to keep their toes turned out or they feel more comfortable with their toes pointed forward when they're squatting. You can make assumptions then that they have this type of retroversion or antiversion in their hips, but you don't need to confirm that with a table test, an orthopedic test or imaging, unless you're finding that there's a discrepancy from side to side that's symptomatic um, and you're having difficulty trying to resolve their symptoms. So these things don't have to be assessed and addressed unless there's a problem. And I think that then it comes down to, and Alyssa, you really like this topic a lot. Okay, so someone looks very asymmetric in their in their lifts. Do we need to address asymmetries? Um, and how much do we need to address asymmetries, you know? Um, so John and Alyssa, I'm curious to get your take on in a squat, if you're noticing someone has like one foot a little bit more forward and they consistently do that, or they consistently turn one toe out a little bit more as they descend into a squat, because we see that a lot, um, or we see kind of people, we put them in one position and they shift their feet into another position, just un, un like sub like unconsciously, they just do this. And like, no matter how many times you say that they do it, and you know, maybe that's just their anatomy, right? Um, so what are your thoughts on addressing those types of things if there is no issue and the potential that that has to cause an issue if it does? I would say that if there aren't symptoms, we don't necessarily need to quote unquote correct it, but mm -hmm. it can be beneficial to make efforts to minimize it, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> minimizing it or taking a person who is most comfortable and feels natural, a little bit asymmetrical can ultimately change the forces on their body to something that is less than optimal for them and lead to symptoms. So we have mm -hmm. to pay attention to that. So it's really, again, like a trial and error kind mm -hmm. of thing. And if I see somebody who's very asymmetrical, I might bring their attention to it. Or if the bar is very offset on their back, which mm -hmm. could be related to you know shoulder tightness, then there's the question of, well, will that offset bar and having more weight on one side aggravate low back or hips? We mm -hmm. don't know. Um, but trying to minimize it, perfection is not necessarily going, you know, what is what is perfect? You know, perfect mm -hmm. is what's going to work best for for every person. But we're all asymmetrical and we see more or less of that in every person's lift depending on their body, how they move. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we could try to minimize it, but we don't need to necessarily address it. Now, if there are symptoms related to it, then we yeah. should look into it a bit more. But what we don't want to do is make somebody symmetrical and then have, <laughs> find have out they're an having issue symptoms yeah, and exactly. say, yeah, but you have to stay in the symmetrical position. No, we need right, to, right. if you need yeah. to turn one foot out a little bit more, then exactly. do it. Yeah, totally agree. Um, John, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I I would agree. I mean, um, you know, if someone, first of all, most people are going to have minor asymmetries, you know, it's very rare that we're going to see people that, you know, their squats, their, their lifts look totally symmetrical, just, you know, um, and if the person is asymptomatic, I don't see a, a reason to mess with that at all. Um, a, kind of an example of this, someone that I've been working with recently, a uh, young guy in his like mid twenties, uh, competitive power lifter, um, came to me really with shoulder pain in his squat, but then also, you know, we've has had issues with recurring back tweaks. Um, and he definitely has a shoulder asymmetry. And one of the things I noticed right away is he was always setting the bar asymmetrically on his back, right? Because of that tightness in his shoulder. So, and he was totally unaware of that, right? So, you know, cleaning up small things like that, if the person is having some trouble, I think can be helpful. But if the person's not having any issues, I don't see a reason to really um, try and correct minor asymmetries. Yeah. All right. Back to the show, folks. <laughs> What's the, so we were just talking about the bony structure or the bony positions, I guess, in the hips. Mm -hmm. um, so we were at retroversion and antiversion. So where do we go from there? So uh, another angle that, you know, may or may not be um, important for some people, 
uh, is referred to as a center edge angle. So that's an angle that essentially uh, is created from the center of the femoral head to the edge of the acetabulum. Um, so it, it gives us an indication of how much uh, the femoral head is essentially covered by the acetabulum. So mm -hmm. when could this be relevant? Well, um, you know, in cases of hip dysplasia, right, that would be an example of where they have a diminished center edge angle, right, where their acetabulum uh, is not um, uh, covering as much of the femoral head as we would expect. And that could be associated with instability in the hip and, and problems like that. Um, and it could also be uh, if you have the opposite where you have an increased center edge angle uh, and average is about 30 to 45 degrees, um, that could lead to problems with uh, femoral acetabular impingement and issues with labral tears and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So, uh, so those are, are kind of three of these you know, bony angles uh, that get created um, when we're talking about um, the femoral head and neck and the acetabulum and, and that sort of thing. Um, and we mentioned the joint capsule and the capsular ligaments and the labrum. Um, well, what is know, this? So talk about, we, we didn't talk too much about the labrum. So mm -hmm. um, can you talk about the function of the labrum and its role in joint congruency and stability and, and shock absorption? Well, so the labrum, uh, we have, first of all, we have a labrum in the shoulder and in the hip, and they basically serve the same function, right? There, It's a ring of fibrocartilage uh, that... Um, originates uh, on the acetabulum and then attaches to the femur. Uh, so it increases stability, uh, decreases the amount of stress that's, or force that's transmitted to the articular cartilage, uh, aids as a shock absor uh, in shock absorption, um, may have a, a small proprioceptive function. So it does a lot of different things for us. Okay. How does a labrum tear in the hip? Um, well, I mean, just like a lot of structures uh, in the body, you know, uh, we do see um, degenerative changes over time, right? So kind of like we talked about with the, the spine, if you were to, you know, do MRIs on, uh, you know, people that have been physically active, middle-aged uh, adults on their, you know, labrum and their hip, you're probably going to see a fair amount of uh, pathology. But um it's gotten a lot more attention over the last 15 years or so as more and more high level athletes have been diagnosed with labral tears, which was previously thought to not be such a big problem for them. Um, and uh, that's made the diagnosis of femoral acetabular impingement, a more common uh, type of thing that we hear orthopedists talk about. And, you know, we see kids now in high school and college getting diagnosed with, uh, whereas, you know, again, previously, that wasn't such uh, a prevalent diagnosis. Um, so the thought is that, you know, the labrum can get pinched uh, in between the acetabulum and the femur in certain positions and with repetitive stress and things like that. Uh, and that could be a contributor um, to causing a tear. Yeah, and with femoral ac femoral acetabular impingement, so there's bony overgrowth of e either the femoral head or the acetabulum, and because mm -hmm. of that attachment of the labrum to the to the fem to the femoral head, when there is that moving, that's kind of and there's the bony overgrowth. That's kind of where the labrum gets ir irritated over and over and over and over again. So it's not that these. Um, you know, oftentimes when we hear people in barbell training specifically who have been diagnosed with FAI and the associated labrum tear with it, uh, they're like, oh, is this pop that I heard? And I, and like, that was the moment where I knew that something was wrong with my hip or, you know, it's, there's always, they, they feel this thing happen in their hip and chances are it wasn't that one moment in time that caused an acute tear to your labrum. It was that, you know, we can hear a lot of popping and snapping. There's something called snapping hip syndrome. There's all these muscles and structures in our hips that can make sounds when we're lifting, um, especially when things move over each other and there's friction or inflammation in those areas already. We can hear sounds that we might not have otherwise heard previously. And so when there's this acute moment where there's a sound 
and pain. And then the person goes to the doctor and gets this diagnosis of FAI with a labrum tear. Um, it's not generally an acute labrum tear. Usually that labrum tear, tear was there and it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. It's like now something in your program, your technique, your recovery has led to this moment in time where your hip cannot tolerate what it's what you're doing to it. And now you've got this pain scenario that has led you to get imaging that has identified things that were there that were just not as irritated as as they are right now. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I just wanted to go over the mechanism by which labrums tear <laughs> because um, it's not a lift or the lift or the moment. It's an accumulation of everything over time, especially when we have these bony overgrowths um, happening. Uh, generally, and I don't know, John uh, and Alyssa, tell me your belief on this. If someone has a labrum tear, in their hip, they likely have FAI of some type, but you wouldn't necessarily find a labrum tear without FAI. How would, how do you feel about that statement? Um, I would say it's possible to tear the labrum without FAI. It's much you know? less common, though, I would say. Probably, yeah. I mean, um, you know, I just thinking about high force type um uh, impacts and things like that right uh, i i think could be associated with this sort of issue any sort of fracture you know right, that you right, have it right. so, you, you yeah. know what i mean so so those so, are more so acute, those are more traumatic acute. Yeah, yeah yeah more yeah. acute traumatic but when we're talking about like the weightlifter the strength athlete and that kind of thing it's generally this has been going on for some time and there's been some slow fraying or tearing of the labrum over time. Yeah, and, I would agree with that. And I mean, you can have FAI without having a labrum tear, you know, um, but they're highly associated with each other. And, um, and also we can be totally asymptomatic with these things. So when, and we're going to sh- have a podcast episode with my story, sharing my story. Um, you know, I'm not completely asymptomatic, but there are, days, weeks, months, and even years where I can go without having really bad hip symptoms, you know? And so we'll share that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't train or that you have to have surgery to fix this, you know? So anyway, um, I just wanted to to take a moment to talk about that because I think that a lot of people get stressed out and worried about it and think that like they can't squat anymore or that, you know, squatting is bad for you because it's going to cause you, it caused that, you know, it doesn't cause that we have these things. Um, and they really develop FAI particularly starts to develop in adolescence. Um, and, and we see that the research shows that, that it starts in adolescence and kind of doesn't get much worse as we get older. We just do a lot more as we get older and then we start to get symptomatic. So um, as we start to recover less. Um, So let's go into, I guess, now talking about the muscular structure, muscular function. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, like I said before, in terms of, um, well, I guess one one other thing that I should mention in in regards to the uh, passive structures, the articular cartilage. Um, so we have the thickest articular cartilage in the acetabulum and the superior portion because that's where we have the greatest amount of compression. You know, so we do have a thick kind of layer of cartilage um, in the acetabulum because of the fact that there is a lot of compressive force that gets transmitted through the joint. But uh, as far as the musculature goes. So I said before, you know, the hip flexes and extends, it AB and AD ducts, and it internally and externally rotates. So we're going to have muscles that, you know, perform all these various functions for us. So uh, if we're talking about the hip flexors, um, you know, the muscles that probably get the most attention are the, uh, ili- the iliopsoas muscles, which is really three different muscles, right? The iliacus and the psoas major uh, and the psoas minor, which not everybody has a psoas minor, but uh, we refer to them collectively, even though they have separate origins, um, their distal attachment is at the same point on the lesser trochanter of the femur. So I would say that those, that's your primary hip flexor, uh, you know, your largest, your strongest hip flexor. Um, 
the TFL, the tensor fascia lata, also uh, contributes to hip flexion. Uh, and to a lesser degree, the rectus femoris, which is your only quadriceps muscle that crosses the hip joint. Um, so that uh, also functions uh, as a hip flexor muscle. Um, in terms of extensors, uh, gluteus maximus, which is your strongest uh, strongest muscle we have in the body, it's your primary uh, hip extensor, uh, gets some help from the hamstring musculature, uh, which their proximal attachment is on the ischial tuberosity, um, and the adductor uh, magnus, which is our largest and strongest adductor muscle, um, also can contribute to hip extension because it does have an attachment at the ischial tuberosity. This, so the same uh, point on the posterior hip that the um, hamstrings attach to. Um, so those are your flexors and extensors. Um, in terms of abductors, uh, primary abductor is your gluteus medius. Uh, also gets uh, assistance from the gluteus minimus muscle um, as well as the TFL. Um, and in terms of adduction, so I mentioned adductor magnus, uh, we have a number of adductor muscles. They all pretty much originate on the pubic bone, uh, and attach at various points to the femur. Um, so the pectineus, uh, the adductor, uh, longus and brevis and magnus, and then the gracilis, which is the only adductor muscle that actually crosses the knee joint, um, and attaches to the proximal tibia. So that, uh, actually the gracilis can aid, uh, the hamstrings in flexing the knee, um, a little bit. Um, and do you want me to stop? I do. I have a question for you. Okay. Why Why do the inner thighs, so the adductors, mm -hmm. why do the mm -hmm. adductors get so sore from squatting? Well, I think that depends on the technique that you're using to a certain extent, right? But um, if you're using uh, a technique in which you are abducting the femur during the descent, so well, pushing then, the knees out. Pushing the knees out, right? Your adductors are going to get stretched uh, eccentrically, right? As we are lowering ourselves down in the squat. Um, and we know that eccentric overload is probably one of the primary drivers of delayed onset muscle soreness. So, uh, so if you're using a technique in the squat, which you're pushing your knees out, um, you know, the adductors are going to get eccentrically lengthened to a more significant degree, and uh, which is not a bad thing, right? I think that enables them to contribute to the stretch flex and mm -hmm. the uh, turnaround out of the bottom mm -hmm. more significantly. Mm -hmm. um, but it is probably going to lead to more soreness in those muscles as well. Now, for someone then who is dealing with an adductor strain or tear, mm -hmm. um, that would make sense then for them to turn their toes a little bit more in so they're not, or a little bit more forward. Yeah, you can modify your squat to minimize the stress on those muscles a little bit by using a more narrow toes forward stance, assuming, you know, you can maintain good mechanics and, mm -hmm. you know, get through the range of motion, things like that. But yeah, that, that would help. Yeah. So I, I want to go back just to talk about when you said that turning the toes, uh, turn, Ad abducting the knees a bit more allows the adductors to contribute more to the stretch reflex mm -hmm. um, in the squat. So one of our goals in terms of cho choosing a technique that supports max, one of our goals is choosing a technical execution of a lift that maximizes strength and muscular development. So can you talk a little bit about how turning the toes out pushing the knees out and incorporating the adductors and grabbing that stretch reflex from them helps to lift more weight and build more strength and muscle mass. Sure. Uh, I, think, I think that's something that's important for a couple of reasons, not just from a standpoint of muscle mass, but um, one, when you're, so if you're pushing the knees out, that would assume that you have your toes turned out slightly, right? Because we want to keep our knees in line, you know, with our feet generally to avoid un any unnecessary, um, you know, twisting forces on the knee. Um, and by pushing the knees out, one, 
the glute muscles that we just talked about are going to be a little bit more engaged because your gluteus maximus, in addition to being an extensor, it's an external rotator. Uh, your glute medius and minimus are abductors, right? So they're going to be performing that function of pulling uh, the femurs out, um, while at the same time, you're now able to load the adductors more significantly um, during the descent. And like we said, uh, primarily adductor magnus, but uh, depending on the adductor muscles attachment points to the pel uh, to the pelvis, you know the pubic bone. If they're more posterior, they can contribute to hip extension. If they're more anterior, they can contribute a little bit to flexion. So, um, so they're going to be able to contribute more to the turnaround out of the bottom, uh, which utilizes a stretch reflex. And what a stretch reflex is uh, is essentially your body uh, being able to better recruit muscle mass for a concentric contraction because of the fact that it's preceded by an eccentric contraction, mm -hmm. right? So during the lowering phase of the squat, the quadriceps are eccentrically lengthening, the adductors are eccentrically lengthening. Um, the hamstrings are probably not changing length to any significant degree because as the knee is flexing, the hip is also flexing. So their net length probably is not changing. Um, the glute muscles should be lengthening uh, as you're going down into hip flexion um, at least a little bit. So, so all of those muscles are being eccentrically loaded. So when we get to the bottom uh, and the stretch reflex is triggered, then they're able to recruit more muscle fibers uh, concentrically because of the fact that they were loaded eccentrically first. Um, so getting the, getting the adductors more involved like that just gives you a little bit more muscle mass to help you lift the weight up. Um, but from a mechanical standpoint, I think that it's almost maybe even more important. Pushing the femurs out gets the femurs out of the way of the pelvis during the descent. So a lot of people that think they can't hit depth mm -hmm. and because their muscles are tight or whatever, mm -hmm. usually it's more a function of the pelvis uh, and the femur kind of contacting each other uh, during the descent and you kind of feeling like that's your bottom position when in reality, if you got them out of the way, the pelvis would better be able to drop down in between the femurs uh, and you would be able to hit depth more easily. Um, in addition, I think it also helps you maintain uh, your spinal alignment to a better degree because again, by getting the femurs out of the way, the pelvis is free to tilt anteriorly a little bit more uh, and you're gonna be able to maintain a better lumbar position. I think what you see with people that are more narrow stance uh, squatters that don't really push their knees out, uh, and some people have the mobility to do that, but for a lot of people, so they get to the point where the femurs and the pelvis are, are maybe coming into contact a little bit, um, and when I say that, I'm talking about the soft tissue structures yeah. and stuff, you know. Yep. Um, so they can either stop there because they feel like that's their bottom or they can continue to go. And if you're not able to get that motion from the front of the hip, well, then you're going to kind of compensate posteriorly and probably lose your back position a little bit uh, as you descend into the to the bottom, um, you know, maybe more than you would like to. So I think it it just helps. It helps with depth. Uh, it helps with maintaining a, a good lumbar position, uh, and it aids in the amount of muscle mass that you'll be able to utilize to help you lift the weight. So, you know, it's kind of a win-win a all the way around. And so keeping your knees out and not letting mm -hmm. them cave in, how how is that going to affect not just, you know, kind of like how much room we have to come down? Because I always say it's like you're running out of space <laughs> yeah. down there, but also the the how the adductors are functioning. Right. So if, if, the, and you know, there, there's some debate about this stuff and, you know, uh, certainly at maximum loads, you're probably going to see a little bit of knee cave. I mean, form breaks down, right. Mm -hmm. As, as things get heavier. Um, so if the, if the knees are collapsing inward uh, prematurely, then essentially the adductors are shortening right? Maybe before we would like them to. And again, mm. so that's going to negatively impact their ability to uh, contribute to to the lift, right? So um, taking it, not even talking about 
maybe some of the forces that you're putting on the knee that you might not want to mm-hmm. or whatever the case is. You know, I don't want to really get into that because people tend to lose their minds uh, talking <laughs> about it. But, and but we're just uh, talking just, about the hip today. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. But um, but yeah, so so let's say you're pushing your knees out. And now all of a sudden they collapse inward. Well, then you're you're shortening the adductor muscles, right? Mm-hmm. And um, that may have a negative impact on their ability to to help contribute to the uh, concentric portion of the lift. Yeah, I mean, I think that we tend to see in the sticking point um, as people are coming out. Typically, where we see knee cave on the squat is you come out of the hole, you got your knees in the right spot, and as you're coming out of the hole your knees start to cave in. And right when you get to the sticking point, that's when your knees are caved in the most. And then to get out of that sticking point, you either got to keep your knees exactly where they are and not let them fall in anymore, or you have to push them out to get out of the sticking point. And if there's a couple of things that I th- that I find concerning there. One, it's not a, it's not a necessarily a safe or strong position to be in because when you've let your knees fall, fall in, you don't have as much adductor strength to help you get out of that position. You've now lengthened the external rotators and the hip extensors so they can't extend the hip as well as they could if they were in their ideal or optimal working position, which is with the, the femurs in line with the feet. So now you're in this subpar position with your hips to continue to finish the lift. And if you can get your knees out, then we're looking at this like internal and external rotation of the hip joint happening under a very heavy load that we don't want. We want to minimize all of those extra things that don't contribute to moving the bar up. So hip internal and external rotation when you're in a sticking position doesn't contribute to moving the bar up. What moves the bar up is hip extension. So we want to keep our thighs and our hips and our knees in the best position to um, produce hip extension against against that external force. So when we fall into this knee cave position, we're not in the best position to do that. Um, So as coaches, we want, or as lifters who are analyzing your own movement, if you start to see that all of your reps and all of your sets start to have this knee cave position or this knee cave movement happening, then we might want to say, hey, this is too heavy for me to maintain the optimal position for my hip to, and all the muscles around my hips to contribute to standing up with the bar. The other thing that's, that concerns me with this internal and external rotation of the, the, the joint under moving load is if you do have any type of um, FAI or labrum tear, you know, that extra movement is just totally unnecessary um, and can contribute to further enhancing FAI development or labrum tears that we don't need to do. Like we we can squat without our knees caving in and without, without contributing to bony overgrowth and fraying of our labrum over time. Um, so uh, that's kind of how I feel about knee cave. And you'll see that People who have knee cave, if you watch them in competition and they get to that point where they can't get their knees out, they fail the lift. So if we can keep our knees out, then hopefully we can finish the lift without failing. Yeah, I think it's kind of an interesting an interesting topic, uh, talking about like the muscular contributions and and that sort of thing and you know how they may shift. Uh, when you're talking about knee cave and like as like I said, I don't want to get too far off topic, right? But you you start to talk about you know moment arms that are created. Are we talking about in the mm-hmm. sagittal plane versus the frontal mm-hmm, plane and mm-hmm. and things like that, right? So mm-hmm. um, there are counter arguments to to what you just said, but I I generally agree, uh, especially with the fact that you know under a, a heavy load like we're in in a squat. We don't really need to be actively, you know, internally and externally rotating, um, and that certainly can be irritating for the joint for anybody that has, you know, a history of of those sorts of issues, like you mentioned. Yeah, and and listen, I agree. Like, I always say that everything is adaptable, but not everything is optimal. And if we have the opportunity to optimize things then it just reduces our risk for injury and for failing and increases our longevity and sustainability and um, 
long-term ability to make continued progress, you know, mm -hmm. and, and reduces our risk for injury. And everything that we're about here at Progressive Rehab and Strength is about longevity, injury risk reduction, and sustainability under the barbell. So if if you don't care about any of those things, then feel free not to listen to us. <laughs> but if you, you know, want to be doing this for a long time, then I think that it would serve you really well to say, let me optimize my movement so that I can do this forever instead of let me just let my knee caves like on every set so that I can just keep adding five pounds to the bar, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, in any event, we have now covered the the hip musculature. What well, else? Not, are we... not all oh, of it. Not all you of know. it. Where mm -hmm. are we now? Uh, so the <laughs> external... forgot about the sartorius. Well, we're going. Uh, to... Are you interrupted, is... John? <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. The, I the... my name should be Doctor Interrupter. <laughs> so the the, the sartorius. Um, I just love that sartorius. It's a. You know, like, I mean, it's a it's a long. Flame. It's muscle. a long, Wait weak a muscle. So, um, <laughs> but so the external rotators, the only thing I, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, the glute is the glute max is your primary external rotator, but then we have these smaller, mm, deeper yes. external rotators, right? So we have the piriformis, uh, we have the obturator internus and externus, we have the gamelli superior and inferior, and we have the quadratus femoris. Now, a lot of people kind of refer to those as almost like the rotator cuff of the hip, right? They're like these deep, short, stabilizing muscles. And all of them, in addition to the uh, gluteus medius and minimus that we mentioned before, attach to the greater trochanter. Um, and the reason that I mentioned that is because that tends to be an area that people develop, um, you know, pain whether it's from bursitis, inflammation of the greater trochanteric bursa, or from tendinopathy of one of those various tendons, uh, the lateral um, aspect of the hip around the greater trochanter tends to be a problem area for people. And we do have uh, a lot of muscle mass that has a direct attachment um, to that to that site. So, um, so I just wanted to kind of throw those out there, uh, and then. The thing that's kind of interesting is that we don't have any musculature whose primary job it is to internally rotate the hip. So the gluteus medius and minimus and the TFL can contribute to internal rotation when the hip is in a, in certain positions. Um, but we don't have, like I just mentioned, all those different muscles that do external rotation, right? Um uh, and we don't have any muscles wh whose primary job is to perform the function of internal rotation. So when we think about internal rotation, um, a lot of times it's almost like, uh, you know, when we're talking about like rotational sports, like, you know, swinging a baseball bat or, you know, uh, uh, shooting like a slap shot in hockey or tennis or, you know, any of these sorts of things, like the internal rotation that's occurring is is like really a function of, uh, the pelvis rotating, you know, more so than there's like musculature that's mm -hmm. actively creating the internal rotation for us, you know? Mm -hmm. I have so many questions about the hip that I think people are interested in. Can we go back to talk, can we talk about stance um, and how people, how um, a wide stance squat can affect someone's ability to produce power it's okay just leave the dogs alone john just leave the dogs alone <laughs> did you miss my question no a wide stance squat and ability to well produce power produce power and also the effects that that has on the pelvis and the hip and how that can contribute to people's issues well i think you know when you're talking about a a wide stance squat right and you know some of these things are very oh, and specific depth, how it can affect your ability to right get to depth. i think i think some of these things are you know very specific to power lifting obviously and you know all of these i mean not necessarily though because when you see you know strengthening like co collegiate strength and conditioning or high school strength and conditioning coaches posting their their clients lifting like they're utilizing these like west side 
techniques and you see these, you know, wide stance squats or not even coaching the squat, just saying squat and people go wide, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a difference between like someone who's just not very well coached and has like a little bit of a wider stance than we would probably coach them to have versus someone that's intentionally using like a wide stance squat, right. like you would see yeah. in like a, a geared powerlifting right. competition, you know? Mm-hmm. And when, so when you you say a wide stance squat, that's kind of what I think of. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think a lot of these techniques that have developed in powerlifting, it's all about minimizing the range of motion that you have to move through. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but there are trade-offs to that. Right. So, so I don't think that necessarily just using the smallest range of motion that you can is necessarily going to guarantee the strongest lift. Um, And we see that all the time because there are, you know, numerous conventional, you know, uh, world record holders Mm -hmm. in in powerlifting as opposed to using sumo, which would be a, a, a shorter range of motion, right? Uh, And same thing. I mean, if you look at if you look at the raw lifters, right, very there may be a couple that utilize a fairly wide stance, but most raw lifters use a pretty moderate stance, right? So, um, so I think that there are trade offs when you're talking about just trying to minimize the range of motion to the greatest degree necessary, and it doesn't necessarily put you in the strongest position, and it's not something that I would recommend uh, for general strength training, right? It's kind of something that's super specific to to competitive powerlifting. And even in that instance, I don't think it's always an optimal uh, position to be in. Um, because, so, I mean, you just mentioned hitting depth, right? And and things like that. I mean, you know, not to get into a whole nother tangent, but a lot what of the- What is depth, John? <laughs> I mean, and so uh, Alyssa, this would be good for, for you to for talk about judge, because you're a, a you're an expert, an expert judge in USAPL, uh, which is probably, you know, the strictest, the, the most strict organization that I've at, competed in, in terms of judging squat depth. Right. But, but every, every powerlifting organization that I'm aware of squat depth is identified as the same thing, right? It's the, it's the, and the rule book is written the same way. In the rule book, it's written (laughs) the same way is what I'm saying. Yes. But so a lot of the organizations that uh, allow for these super wide squats, I mean, if we're being honest, we know that they're not hitting depth. That's the way that it's written in the rule book. Right. Um, So that's very obvious. Right. So why are they not hitting depth? Well, you know they're re- they're reaching the maximum extensibility of their musculature prematurely right before they can actually get into a position where their hip is is lower than their knee because of the extreme you know wide stance that they're uh that they're taking you know so and again you know kind of like we were just talking about with the knee cave it's you're shifting the moment arms around right so you're So you're trying to, when you use a really wide stance squat, what are you doing? You're trying to minimize the moment arm in the sagittal plane, right? Because the torso is going to stay more upright. The hips aren't going to move as far back, but you're increasing it in the frontal plane. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you're just shifting the stresses around um, from one to the other. So, so, you know, it's, it's going to be an individualized thing as to what position you're actually stronger in, I would say. Um, but Alyssa, I, I would be curious to hear what you, uh, you, you know, think about, you know, a wide stance squat, uh, and you know, how it relates to depth and, and that sort of thing. So I, you know, I know some, some people who are very strong squatters who squat with a wide stance, but what I tend to see is that when they miss a lift or fail the lift, it often, you know, it's hard to sit there right there and watch it and say it's because of mm. X, mm-hmm. but it's very clear that it, it has to do with the fact that they're just not, they have no power at a certain point yeah. because of how their mus- the musculature is, is contracting or not. And maybe we see the knees start to come in a little bit, but keeping, keeping the, so again, we don't want to talk about, like, we don't mm-hmm. want to go too deep into the, the knee thing, but, but keeping your femurs out and maintaining that hip position and maintaining that external rotation is just harder Mm -hmm. with a wider stance for most people because and a wider stance and more toe out depending Mm -hmm. because 
you have to externally rotate more. Um, and I do think that there are people who squat very wide and have trouble hitting depth uh, from what I see as a, as a referee, you know, obviously mm -hmm. there are a lot of reasons why people have trouble hitting depth and, and what might pass in a competition might not be what we would refer to as optimal technique. Um, but I, you know, I don't, I would what? say that not the majority of lifters are squatting like alarmingly wide. I say alarmingly right, right. Cause like you, when you see a wide, a really wide stance, yeah. you're like, Oh Yeah. <laughs> But I think, you know, just to kind of go back to that power idea that, you know, we were talking about that with the knees caving in, all of this comes down to, from a power standpoint, is when you get to that hardest point of the lift, are you able to generate enough power to get through the area of the lift that is the hardest to move through? And with the knees caving in, it puts the hip in a poor position um, to, to continue to generate force unless you can get those knees out. And in the same thing with the wide stance, wider stance squat, even if it's not this like super kind of like west side geared lifting wide stance squat, the wider your stance is, the more um, slipping, the, the, the we're looking at the forces going through the foot um, as well. There's more horizontal um, outward force of the foot so we can slip a little bit more we're disp displacing force to the sides of our feet um and w we just really don't have that gener that force generation capacity in the middle of the lift because our knees are already in a caved position when our stance is a little bit wider we we can't get them out any further you know so it just puts us in this more internally rotated position um an abducted position which isn't a great position for us to generate force anyway um and then the other thing that i see from just like an injury perspective is that sometimes people when they come to me with hip pain or adductor pain and we look at their stance and we say well you're putting a lot of you're putting extra strain on your adductors and you're putting extra strain on the hip joint because of how wide your stance is. Um, so that's just even like a slightly wider stance. You know, we just narrow it a little bit and their adductors aren't as taxed and their hip joints aren't as irritated, you know? But, um, oh gosh. I would say that even even those people who, who I see squat very wide and who do a good job at keeping their femurs in line and knees sort of out with their toes, um, I often see if they fail they're still that like they're failing at the bottom when everything is just so stretched mm -hmm. um and length end you know when it comes to uh adductors external mm -hmm. rotators mm -hmm. and it's usually not it's either at the bottom or shortly after they drive yeah. out of the bottom yeah um because of the force production mm -hmm. down there well regardless and, and what the knees are doing the way that i think of it is um like I said before, it's a trade-off, right? You're trying to minimize the range of motion that the joints have to move through, but you're not necessarily putting the musculature in the best position to generate force. And if we're talking about a really wide stance squat with a very upright torso um, and minimizing the moment arms in the sagittal plane, the hip extensors, right, they are not put in the best position to generate force. So I think that's probably why you're observing what you're what you're talking about, Alyssa, in terms of like that lack of ability to drive mm -hmm. through that sticking point mm -hmm. is because the hip extensors just can't, they're not in a position where they can generate enough force to do it. Um, I, I do have to say, though, someone that is a wide stance squatter that is like executes it really, really well is Jordan Wong. He's got a he's got a very efficient Mm -hmm. wide stance mm -hmm. squat like every single rep looks the same and you know his, uh, but uh i think he, so he's it's almost more more the it's exception interesting. it's interesting than, than though because rule. i would want you to go look at his leg anatomy mm -hmm. jordan wong has very internally rotated femurs and very externally rotated tibia and feet mm -hmm. so i would be curious for you to go look at his um his leg anatomy going back to the conversations that we had in in the beginning and seeing is that actually putting his hip in a better position? And yeah. this is where we go down to saying the exception versus the rule when we have our kind of standardized model to look at a 
squat or any lift. Um, it's based on kind of the general most common anatomy and, mm-hmm. and, and biomechanics that we see. But then, yes, we tweak everyone's anatomy to conform to what's optimal for their body, what allows them to train the most, the, the most optimally, utilize their muscles and their joints um, and ligaments and tendons optimally, right? But also, like I said, not every, you know, like I said, everything is adaptable, but not everything is optimal, right? So Jordan Wong is one of those people who's been training for a very, very, very long time. So he's been, he's very adapted to this, whether or not it's his anatomy or not. So we have people who um, can adapt to it over time versus like if you're just starting or you've been doing this for a while or you're chronically getting injured, then we would say it's not optimal for you to to do that, you know? Um, but there was something I was going to say about, um, can't remember. Oh, yes. Um, kind of going back to this issue of people feeling like they can't hip depth, be- depth because they're too tight. And there's this whole like, oh, they're too tight. They don't have the hip mobility to squat to depth, blah, 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 blah. John and Alyssa, I have questions for you or a question for you. In your lifetime, as a coach, as a physical therapist, how many clients or patients have you been unable to get to squat to depth? And was it because of their hip tightness or their muscular tightness surrounding the hip or something else? I'll defer to Alyssa to answer first. <laughs> I'm not thinking of any off the top of my head. <laughs> well, we have one, that, Alyssa, that we shared. And and John, you'll probably think of that. Um which we were able Oh yeah. We don't have to say the name. John, you would you would know who it was. <laughs> I'd have to, I could type it to you. (laughs) I mean, what I, what I would say, what I would say to answer that kind of like Alyssa's initial reaction is like, it's really hard to think of any, uh right? I mean, there have been situations where I've had people that couldn't squat to death um, initially, but that was usually because of an injury or uh, a strength issue or a strength issue. If we're talking about an older adult, right? right? If we're talking about an older person, it's a strength issue. If we're talking about a younger person, it's because they have some sort of injury to their hip or their back, not because of muscular tightness. I can't think of any client that I've ever worked with that could not get into a, a good squat position uh, simply because of muscular tightness. It's just right. not, it's just not really um, a great reason. So if, if you have a coach telling you that. Um, that you need to stretch out your hamstring or something. Yeah. To get it, it's not. Well, and like, uh, like we mentioned before, in, in the squat, the hamstrings aren't changing length like, anyway. You could, you could have <laughs> tight hamstrings and it should not affect your squat one little bit, you know? So, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, uh, it's a, it's a poor excuse, you know, yeah. whether it's, whether people believe that, or it's just because they had a coach or a physical therapist or somebody tell them that um, it's, it's not really a great excuse. People that people that have experience coaching people understand that it's, it's really not a reason for people to. Um, well, I don't think that's a de- fair statement that people who have experienced coaching people, because there are people who have experienced coaching people, but don't know how to coach the squat properly. And that, you know, can be a reason why they can't get people to squat to depth. So definitely check out our uh, squat video our squat episode, <clears throat> how to coach the squat, um, because there's like one reason why someone wouldn't be able to squat to depth because of their hip. And that is, be, be, well, two, uh, severe osteoarthritis that limits, physically limits their joint range of motion or um, muscular contracture or scar tissue related to surgery or some type of neurological condition. Um, so those would be the two scenarios and Alyssa and John, like, I'll tell you who the name, the person is after we get off this, this podcast, but John, you've met this person. They've come, I saw them at the gym that I used to see people out of, and I've seen them in, in our gym at home. So you definitely know this person. Yeah. I know who you're talking yeah. about. Um, and this person has severe OA in his hips. And the only way that this person was able to get down to depth is by utilizing severe lumbar, um, flexion to get into, to the, into the proper squat position. So we, you know, oh, and then also, um, 
one of the we have an episode coming out with this other client, Matthew DePaula. He's a uh, an orthopedic surgeon. It's coming out at the end of this month because he had two hip surgeries um, on the same hip. So again, this his depth issue is related to surgeries that he had in his hip and not muscular tightness. It's not because of that. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about his hip issue coming up at the end of this month on the podcast. So that's episode 43. So those are two people um, that I have worked with that I have been unable to achieve depth with um, in my 10 years, 11 years as a physical therapist related to the hip. Depth issues are typically more related to the ankle. Um, And those really, however, are not related to just general ankle inflexibility. We tend to see it with some type of ankle injury that has led to severe range of motion restriction in the actual ankle joint. So mobility of your muscles, flexibility of your muscles to do a proper squat the way that we teach it, you will not generally see an issue related to muscle length or tension. Do we agree? Agreed. Excellent. Yeah. I'm glad we're all on the same page. So people out there, <laughs> you do not need to work on your ankle flexibility. Um, your ankle mobility probably isn't the problem. It's, you know, most people have enough ankle mobility to, if you can walk upstairs, if you can get down to the floor without using, you know, a, an assistive device or the couch, <laughs> um, then if you can get down and up off the floor, um, you've got enough ankle mobility to squat and you've got enough hip mobility to squat as well. All right. Is there anything else that you think that we need to touch on to uh, about the hip or do you think we kind of covered it all? Uh, in terms of its anatomy, I think we basically covered it all. Um, so I think we're done. Cool. That was a really good um, chat about the hip. The hip is something we really love here at PRS. um, And we have a lot of good content coming out on the hip as well. So if you've got any questions related to the hip, we do live Q&As once a month in our free Secret Society of Barbell Mastery. Uh, We also do free form checks in there on Wednesdays and Fridays. We also just, you know, engage and ask answer any questions that you guys have. So you can just post your questions in there as well. If you need help with a hip injury or any other type of injury related to barbell training or not related to barbell training, um, you can contact us and book a free consultation with one of the PRS clinical coaches here at PRS. And um, you can also, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that we do? Free consultation. I mean, we do lots of things. (laughs) <laughs> but free stuff. Um, you can join our Facebook, oh, our newsletter. You can get on our newsletter to get access to all the, the podcast episodes early. Uh, we do offer free lectures twice a month. So if you're on our newsletter, you will get the links to those lectures every month. We do literature reviews and case study presentations and all that great stuff. So we would love to have you. So just click the link in the show notes to sign up for our newsletter, get into a free Facebook group and book a free consultation if you need help with injuries or just general, that's what I meant to say, general coaching or programming for strength training or powerlifting. So thank you, John, as always for joining us. Alyssa, thank you for being my lovely co-host as usual. I always enjoy having both of you on the podcast and can't wait to talk more about other things. We have a whole upper extremity curriculum coming up soon. So see you guys soon. Bye for now.